Paris Perspective. Hello and welcome to this edition of Paris Perspective with me, David Coffey. Well, the European Union recently announced its sixth sanctions package against Russia in response to the February invasion of Ukraine. However, Moscow has hoped to split EU resolve on the bloc's importation of Russian oil and gas, with Hungary and Slovakia looking for exemptions over the next two years. Now, the EU currently depends on Russian gas for 45% of its imports and 40% of its consumption. 25% of oil imports to Europe also come from Russia. But will increased sanctions against the Kremlin bring an end to the war in Ukraine and force Vladimir Putin to come to the negotiating table? There are doubts about the success of economic pressure on Russia, which has weathered a litany of embargoes uncomfortably, but resiliently enough to date. On Paris' perspective, we're going to take a look at what lessons can be learnt from Iran about the efficacy of Western sanctions in bringing Tehran back in from the cold following the 2015 nuclear deal that allowed Tehran limited uranium enrichment program to return and in return for sanctions relief. Now, today I'm joined by lawyer and author and Middle East uh, defense expert Ardavan Amir Aslani. Ard Ardavan, it's great to have you back in it's our It's a fine. mutual pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, Today, let's just start. Iran has been subject to various levels of sanctions for over four decades now, the most severe being implemented by US President back, uh, Barack Obama back in uh, 2011 uh, over Tehran's uranium enrichment program. Now, what was the direct impact of sanctions on Iran under Obama back in 2011? I mean, as you rightly mentioned, Iran has been going through sanctions for four decades now. Uh, as history has proven, beginning from the Cuban situation as, since 1962, sanctions, no matter how severe they are imposed over other sovereign nations, have never resulted in forcing submission upon that sovereign state at hand. They have, however, managed to transform the lives of ordinary people into hell. So what's happened in Iran is exactly that. The people have been suffering. Unemployment has been on the rise. Inflation has been on the rise. Hope for the betterment of the economy has, is inexistent. However, the government is still in place as strong as ever and going through this with a great degree of ease. Mm -hmm. Now, back in 2013, there was this interim relief deal um, uh, that was done ahead of the 2015 uh, nuclear deal, the definitive deal in which the, uh, the US pulled out of back in 2018. But what was the impact on Iran's GDP when that little easing of sanctions happened two years after the main ones in 2011? You see, when you talk about Iran, you're talking about an economy uh, and a potential growth economy that is larger than the absorption of all of the East European countries pursuant to the fall of the Berlin Wall. Mm -hmm. So it is not a package of a couple of billion dollars here and there that will have a substantial impact on the Iranian economy and on the lives of the people. Uh, there were relief packages back then in 2013 before the enactment of the uh, nuclear agreement commonly known as the JCPOA, mm -hmm. as there have been a couple of months ago uh, pursuant to American authorization that South Korea released some Iranian funds pursuant to Iranian oil exports. They are too insignificant and they come too late to have any meaningful impact on the Iranian economy, which is going through dire straits these days. And that brings me to um, a point that I think is key in our conversation today. I mean, with the forty or the forty years plus of, of uh, sanctions against Iran following uh, the the revolution, um, you, you mentioned there on, on blocking funds that may be in South Korea. Now, what exactly? And this is very pertinent to what's happening with Russia today. Um, what exactly are the mechanisms in place to circumvent sanctions? I mean, is it third party banks in foreign territories? How does one get around it? Because there is a way. Yes. It Iran has become uh, an expert on trying to uh, circumvent international sanctions. They are experts as far as shipping oil internationally through sham corporations that they incorporate on a daily basis. Sometimes during the, the, the voyage of a, a an oil tanker, they change ownership and the flag of that uh, vessel five times before it reaches its ultimate destinations. Mm -hmm. They know all the tricks of the trade. 
but at the end of the day, what matters is actually finding a buyer for the oil, finding a buyer for the refined products. And that is the most difficult part. The luck of the Iranians, and same thing with the Russians, the luck of the Russians is that you still have got China out there. Because what we need to understand in relation to the Russian situation today, it's not the entire world against Russia. It is the OECD, basically speaking, Western Europe, Japan, South Korea. That's it. India, China, vast majority of the Middle East, even the Arab countries, Africans are not involved in the sanction story, which means that they are willing to do business with Russia as they are willing to do business with Iran. The biggest buyer being China. China is heavily dependent upon importation of oil from oil producing countries. And China has been constantly acquiring Iranian oil in substantial quantities over the years. And the Americans have demonstrated that they're loath to the concept of putting additional sanctions on China. Once in a while, they put a sanctions on a subsidiary of, of a Chinese entity, but it never is hard enough to create any strain over the relationship between China and the United States. So the trick of the trade is, is there a buyer out there? And there are buyers out there, especially will be. at the barrel of uh, oil being valued at in excess of $100 compared to 50 two years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the difference, however, one could say now between uh, sanctions against Russia now and sanctions against Iran in the past is the speed of their implementation. I mean, literally within two days of the invasion on uh, February 24th of Ukraine, uh, the sanctions were rolled out, the first wave of them. Um, and also Moscow, the Moscow stock market, one could argue, is more globally connected than its equivalent in Tehran. So what are the disparities, though, between the sanctions well, and the, the two? The, the, there are quite substantial disparities. First of all, the Iranian currency has been cut off of the international financial mm -hmm. market for four decades. It has been many, many years that you can't actually transfer any funds to or from Iran. This was not the case with the Russian ruble. And even today, you have banks in Russia that have not been sanctioned that can freely, albeit quite difficultly, transfer funds and receive funds into Russia. The huge difference over here is that it seems as if the entire Western community was actually well prepared for imposing these sanctions over Russia. It's as if they were expecting this invasion and that the corroborating legal documentation for the imposition of sanctions were already in place. And that's a huge mistake that uh, Putin made. He underestimated the resolve of the West in relation to the Ukraine situation. He thought that the West would react as they did in 2014 pursuant to the annexation of Crimea rather mildly. This was not the case. And immediately those sanctions were imposed. And what matters is that when you're talking about Western sanctions, they have a global impact. The United States sanctions, pursuant to the uh, uh, secondary sanctions that the United States government has the ability to impose upon other countries, impact foreign corporations abroad who do business with Russia, which means that their impact is much more global. You know, at the end of the day, it's about you know uh, power. You know, it's 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 more about power than the law. If Kenya were supposed to impose global sanctions, it won't have an impact as large as that out of the United States, but the U.S. being the largest market out there, any sanctions, especially secondary sanctions imposed upon any country will have an immediate impact globally. That's why today Russia is encountering so many difficulties. That's why the ruble crumbled. That's why their stock market encountered difficulties. Although they try to catch up between certain local measures, the central bank controlling foreign currency transfers abroad, etc. But still, the Russian economy is in the process of being totally strangled. Indeed, and you touched upon it there. Uh, Europe, indeed, will be harder hit uh, with uh, Russia out of the picture than Iran, of course, back in the day. You know, you know I Iran is now a battle hardened as far as sanctions are concerned. <laughs> you know, for decades, pretty much provide a certain degree of resilience for the country at hand. Bearing in mind that the Iranian government calls its annual budget, budget of resilience. They're prepared for sanctions. They're prepared for hardship. The Russians are less prepared. However, when you look at the history of Russia ever since the Second World War, war and the 20 million people that they lost during the Second World War, they also have a history of being able to sustain substantial hardship. Not as experienced as Iranians are, but with a history that resembles that of Iran. Well, that uh, it was a question that I was going to bring up a little later in the uh, in our in our conversation today, but I, I, I will jump ahead to it. I mean, both Iran and Russia indeed do have a common history of revolutions in times of crisis. Now, how effective, and this is going a little bit off piste here about, uh, uh, about the actual state control of the people that they govern, how effective was the Iranian state-controlled media in containing criticism of Tehran's policies as Putin appears to be doing in Russia? Of course, it, it, it it is, it is quite effective as far as national media is concerned. Mm. However, nobody in Iran watches, watches national television. Mm. Everybody's connected through various 
VPN systems or satellite television or internet broadcasting systems to foreign media. So nobody in Iran is fooled by the version that the government is trying to convey. At the end of the day, uh, the situation in Iran and Russia is quite different. When you look at Iran, the vast majority of the Iranian population is at odds with the position of the Iranian government. That doesn't seem to be the case, at least for now in Russia, where the vast majority of Russian population is behind Putin, uh, clearly sharing his, his, his worldview that Russia is under attack by NATO and the Western world. Uh, he's trying to control the media locally by preventing, for example, a media to utilize the word war when you talk about the quote, quote, special uh, military operations over there. But uh, it's not even necessary to do that because the people over there, majority of them share his version of the facts. In Iran, it's different. But despite that, the level of, of control that the government in Iran exercises over the population makes any kind of actual uh, revolt uh, leading to an efficient modification of the status of matters is, is quite uh, uh, insignificant. So that's, that's not going to happen. Now, looking back... Uh um, at the sanctions, um, I mean, the, the kind of, let's just say, the, the international sanction playbook uh, uh, usually applies to targeted sanctions against elites who are close to power, freezing financial assets and, you know, severe limitations on the access uh, to international finance. But how effective now were those sanctions? You say that Iran is battle-hardened. How effective were they in bringing Iran to the negotiating table to finalise the 2015 Honestly um, deal? speaking, not very effective at all. I mm. mean, look, today the negotiations have reached a stalemate, where the Iranians are not showing up, the Americans are not showing up, the entire operation is, 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 is in a state of inertia pursuant to the American refusal of removing the Iranian Revolutionary Guards from the foreign terrorist organization in the United States. And despite that, nobody seems to be in a situation of particular uh, pressure mm. to push the other one to come to the negotiating table. The same thing is true for Russia. This uh, recourse to sanctions is, is, is basically something that has never delivered the political results that the imposing countries are looking for. All that is entailed is the suffering of the local population on the wrong premise that this population is going to revolt against the governing authorities mm -hmm. because of the hardships. Iran is going through this entire process for the last 43 years and nothing has happened. You've had revolts here and there, yeah. but that they haven't managed to destabilize the regime in Iran. And the same true is in, true is in Russia, all the more so that the people over there are not even inclined to revolt because they're in agreement with the position of the president. Yes. And this also uh, brings me to, like, you know, the detractors of sanctions against Russia here in Europe, such as Hungary's Viktor Orban, who was close to Putin himself personally. Um, you know, to the detractors of maintaining embargoes, you know, it's always got to do with this will have a negative effect on the actual ordinary Russians on the ground, as people have said in the past about Iranians on the ground. So, I mean, for the past, well, let's just say for the past decade, what has been the impact to normal Iranians? We could see, I have graphs here in front of me while um, uh, looking into our conversation today, where you could see the first round of sanctions, the real was devalued by 48%. And then in the second round of sanctions that were imposed by Donald Trump, it went even further up to almost 60% devaluation. How does that translate to the uh, average uh, Iranian uh, on the street? I'll give you an example. In 1979, mm -hmm. the parity between the US dollar to the Iranian currency was $1 for seven two months. That's the Iranian currency. Mm -hmm. Today, it's $1 to 30,000 two months. This by itself illustrates the loss of the purchasing power of the Iranian two month real. Mm -hmm. against international hard currency. Mm -hmm. So the people have suffered. It, 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 there's even no need for me to state that the country is going through uh, extreme hardship as far as the economy is concerned. The, the industries are having difficulties in acquiring uh, raw material needed for their production. The young population is totally uh, in a state of, of uh, hopelessness, pursuant to a lack of jobs, lack of hope. They can't get married. They can't get accommodation for themselves. They, they have a tendency to remain with their parents because of lack of financial means to afford uh, accommodation by themselves. So the situation is horrendous. There's a vast movement of immigration going abroad. People want to find a decent yeah. life elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So the, the country is in shambles. The economy is in dire straits. The people are suffering. 
But bearing in mind that the purpose of these sanctions was to change the regime, they haven't managed to deliver. Same thing in Russia. You know, the, the European governments were the first governments that wanted to protect the oligarchs in relation to their rights to private property yeah. and the, the, the rule of law. Now, the European Union has not only baffled its prior understanding of what international law means, it has seized and frozen their assets, in some cases confiscated them, certain instances depriving them of the nationality, Western nationality, that they had validly obtained. Now there's talk of preventing Russians from acquiring real property in Europe. There, 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 there's London talk of being the prime preventing target, them from say. traveling abroad yeah. and under the hope that these oligarchs would exercise pressure over Putin. The exact opposite has happened in the sense that the oligarchs discovered, hey, the only place where our money is safe is in Russia, so we better get closer to Putin. So non-compliance with international law, non-compliance with the respect of the rule of law has not only hurt the Western world, but has also brought these oligarchs, which are supposed to be the agents of change against the Putin regime, even closer to the president of Russia. Yeah. Now, the, it just reminds me, just um, before, in the run-up to uh, the invasion in February of Ukraine by Russia, um, there were lots of pundits on French television saying, Vladimir Putin, he's only got six uh, weeks of money left in his coffers. Yes. That proved to be completely and utterly false. No, um, but one thing I do want to say is, where do you think Russia will turn to now? We did mention, on, you know, China has been sitting on the fence, does not want to take sides, has been very much um, accommodating to bringing in Iranian oil and Russian oil. But what markets do you think Russia will actually now turn to? As we mentioned, after the 45% supply to Europe of gas is now shut off. You know, this this idea of pundits, pundits saying things that turn out to be total baloney mm. a few days after, we are quite accustomed to that, aren't we? <laughs> I mean, how many times did we hear those same pundits mention that the Assad regime in Syria is going to fall uh, every week and in eight years that's been going on, the guy's still around. Mm. Um, uh, in, in relation to these specific matters, the, Russia hasn't even demonstrated its, its, its power of nuisance should it want it to do. You know, we keep on talking about uh, the dependency of Europe to Russian oil and gas, which is a fact, mm. which cannot be replaced overnight. And even if we had alternative options as far as liquefied natural gas is concerned, the countries that are in dire need in Eastern Europe don't even have the, the infrastructure for unloading the yeah. LNG at hand. Yeah. France, for example, is 70 percent nuclear, 30 percent gas importing everything from Norway. So France is not hurt. It's not the case of Poland. It's not the case of Germany. Ukraine. It's not the case of Germany. These countries, if they were supposed to be cut off from Russian oil and gas, as we get closer to winter in six months from now, how are they going to survive? You can't build an LNG downloading facility in six months. Mm -hmm. And the power of Russia is even beyond that. You know, today the Americans are rushing uh, towards reestablishing relations with Venezuela, a regime that they wanted to overthrow since Chavez and now Maduro, and saying, forget about the past, let's become friends so that they can be, uh, supply, import Venezuelan oil and export as much oil from the US to Europe, replacing Russia as the supplier of oil and gas to Europe. But at the end of the day, the genuine power of Russia is about just ceasing to produce. I and mean, what would the world become if Russia, the day after tomorrow, was supposed to decide not to export a barrel out of the 12 million that they daily produce? Yeah. That's going to push the economy of the entire a planet into a total recession and the barrel will be at $300. That is the power of Russia that has even utilized. But for the moment of surviving, you mentioned the countries in Eastern Europe, such as Serbia, such as Hungary, such as uh, Slovakia, that are willing to acquire Russian oil. China is still going to go doing that on and off. Uh, it's, it's a better market for China because they can afford to import its oil at even a cheaper price than the price that they paid for Iranian oil. You'll have countries in, 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 in Africa that will continue acquiring acquiring it. The same mechanism of sanctions busting and circumventing international sanctions that uh, were entailed in Iran is going to uh, apply to, to Russia. Mm -hmm. So is the economy going to go down the drain? Certainly. Will that compel the regime from uh, changing its course? I don't think so. As a matter of fact, I believe that the fact that the United States and the Europeans as, 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 as followers of the American path, uh, the, the harsh attitude they've adopted with reference to the Russian president can only put, entail two things. Either uh, capitulation, that's not going to happen because it's the fall of the Russian regime and fall of the president of Russia, or a radicalization of the regime. And that is what may most likely happen if this course of clash were supposed to be followed upon.
Well, indeed, that is uh, one of the fears that we have, that the radicalization could use to the use of tactical nuclear weapons. If he, uh, a, a, a friend of mine, a colleague who's actually working out of Lviv in Ukraine, has just said that Putin has gone 100% Blofeld, like uh, the, the famous James Bond villain. Uh, it, but it is, uh, there are, could there be a silver lining here with, um, with this uh, impending um, cutoff or shortage of oil that could bring the barrel up to $300 um, could that then fast track the uh, the transition then to green and sustainable energy? I mean, uh, we, is the investment out there to do so? The, the money is out there. The, the 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 modification of international statutes governing oil and gas production are out there. But it's a question of time. Will that happen quickly enough to be able to push Russia into a corner and force it to capitulate? I don't think so. You're looking at something that's going to take decades. Decades. Sure. decades. It's not going to happen anytime soon. So dependency on oil and gas and fossil fuel is something that we will have to live with over time. Mm -hmm. Now, getting the nuclear deal back on track, uh, focusing on Iran, um, that it's been suspended uh, due to Russia trying to well use its participation in uh, the, the forum as leverage in preventing UN sanctions, which of course the Biden administration uh, insists should remain separate uh, geopolitical issues. What do you think the next step will be? And the other question that is slipped in there, do you think that Russia really wants it to get back on track? It's a very interesting question. First of all, Russia at one point blocked the discussions, mm -hmm. saying that it wanted its commercial transactions and its financial transactions with Iran to be beyond the scope of international sanctions taken pursuant to the Ukraine situation. And they obtained written guarantees from the United States government mm -hmm. that that will be the case. Mm -hmm. So they that, they that that was obtained and solved. What is pending today has nothing to do with Russia. It has to do with with the listing of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, IRGC, on the FTO, Foreign Terrorist Organization list of the United States government. And that's a problem. It's a problem for Iran. It's a problem for the United States. It's a problem for Iran because the current Iranian administration that our President Raisi needs to demonstrate to the Iranian public that has achieved something more than what the previous government of Rouhani did. If he was supposed to go back offering the same deal on the same terms, he lose credibility. So he has insisted on the removal of the IRGC from the FTO. List. And the Americans, uh, although the consequences are going to be insignificant, because even if you remove the IRGC from the far -turn or foreign terrorist organization list, they will still continue being listed on the specially designated national list, which prevents doing business with them anyhow. However, it has become a domestic political issue. Six months before the midterm elections in the United States, next November, congressional elections, the Biden administration cannot afford to unlist the FTO from the uh, terrorist organization list, because then you have all the Republicans under Trump's guidance, beating down his neck, saying that, okay, you delisted this organization that has killed Americans. Mm -hmm. So it's blocked in America, it's blocked in Iran, and I don't see how it may be resolved before we reach the congressional elections in November. And this is a problem, because at the same time, the Iranians are moving their civilian centrifuges underground at the Nathan's facility. They're continuing enriching far above what was initially mentioned in the JCPOA, the nuclear agreement. And this creates a, a, an additional uh, potential crisis in the region, where by Israel may actually attack Iranian facilities and then we'll be out in all all out war in the Middle East, which is going to be something even worse than what we're witnessing in the Ukraine situation. We should remember, however, and this is what the, the Iranian community and the international community consider as a double standard. Mm -hmm. Look at Yemen, for example. The war in Yemen has been ongoing now for seven years. You've had 550,000 dead civilians over there. Arms were, are being provided by Western Europe and the United States and nothing is coming out of this war aside from human sacrifice. Nobody is raising a voice. In Ukraine, you've had a, a few thousand dead. Even one dead is too much, but still, numbers matter. A few thousand civilian dead, and the entire world and the Western world is in bananas uh, or freaking out of the crisis. And this double standard policy has entailed another loss of credibility for the Western world and for the United States. That's why it has become an OECD issue and not a planetary issue. For now, exactly, For indeed, exactly. That's it. as uh, we keep on quoting. Let's hope it'll be Cold War II rather than World War III. Um, now, um, Ardovan, as a Paris-based lawyer and uh, somebody who has also written many books, especially about how to open business with um, Iran in the wake of the lifting of sanctions back in 2015. Um, 
Looking here for the importance of France, and you're mentioning the proxy war that has been going on in Yemen with almost uh, uh, half a billion people, uh, half a million people, people killed, sorry, excuse me, um, half a million people killed. Um, you know, France has also been party to the sale of weapons over there. Um, but um, for the uh, actual, um, the GCPOA, the 2015 Iran nuclear deal, in your opinion, how important is it, do you believe, for France to get the b deal back on track? Because uh, we remember um, the MEDEF business leaders here in France, they were almost like, it was almost ironic, they were like the first on the first plane out of here over to Tehran to sign deals and to get everything inked and get uh, the oil back up and running and get uh, foreign and direct investment back up and running. Is that important uh, for, for France? For France, it is extremely the... important. Why so? Because for every Iranian need, there is a French response. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Iranian automotive market, for example, was dominated by the French for the last four decades with, between Peugeot and, and uh, Citroën and Renault. That's fundamental. Iranian airport infrastructure was hoping for Vinci airports and uh, ADP to jump into the market. Iranian maritime ports were counting groups such as Bolloré to come in. There is a huge water issue in Iran. There is a French response, Suez, Veolia, and I could go on and on. Sure. However, all these companies have been hurt and they've left a lot of skin behind pursuant to the rather unexpected Trump withdrawal from the JCPOA in May 2018. All of them left hundreds of millions of euros behind. That's the case for Celanti Spesa, for example, or dozens of millions for Total and other corporations who had to leave in 24 hours pursuant to the implementation yeah. of, uh, of US sanctions. Now, these companies are not going to go back and commit to the same investments as they did in the past because they know that US presidential elections are co coming shortly. Uh, they're not even certain Democrats would be able to keep their meager majority in the United States Senate. It. So they're not going to commit to the Iranian market at any substantial level, bearing in mind that you may end up with Trump or an invitation thereof coming back into power and compelling them to leave again. So what you're going to witness this time is not going to be a rush towards Iran, but it's going to be a very, very uh, delicate balance of overnight sales of certain finalized products to Iran. It's a pity because Iran and the return of Iran to the international financial system is, is huge. It, it, is, it is large than the absorption of all of all of these in European countries pursuant to the fall of the Berlin Wall. Iran is an industrial state, which is not the case of Russia, mm -hmm. with consumer products in every field that is a necessity for survival of any given population. Um, Iran is the answer to the global need for oil and gas. Iran has the largest gas reserves in the world, the third proven oil reserves in the world. So the return of Iran to the international economy is, is a guarantee of stability for the energy markets, if not for the uh, political situation in the Middle least and elsewhere. But will that happen? Well, it's only become, it has only become a matter of, of wild guessing because logic doesn't seem to prevail anywhere in the Middle East. And that's uh, a great way to, uh, to cap our conversation today. Lawyer, author and Middle East defense expert Ardovan Amir Aslani, thank you very much for joining me on Paris Perspective. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having invited me. And thank you for watching and listening to this edition of Paris Perspective. As always, you can get all of our editions of Paris Perspective on rfienglish.com forward slash podcast and indeed wherever you get your podcasts from me, David Coffey. Goodbye for now and we'll be back in two weeks time.